Good morning. How's everybody this morning, individually, one by one? Should we go around the room? Just, just a joke. Start with a joke, that's what I've heard. Uh, I'd like it if you can turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. That's where we are uh, reading this morning because we're starting a new series and I'm super, super excited uh, about it. I believe that God's got something for us as a church uh, in terms of uh, where he wants to take us and the trajectory that he wants to take us on. And interestingly, it's, it's not necessarily uh, about, you know, sort of, I guess, plans and, and strategies. It's more about a people. Building, uh, building a people uh, is what God is interested in. Amen. Building individuals and, uh, and speaking to us and uh, changing lives and changing hearts is, uh, is the business that God is in, yeah? yeah. So good, so good. So as you're, uh, as you're talking, uh, sorry, turning to Nehemiah chapter 1, I want to tell you about my plans for my garden. <laughs> I've got plans Got plans for the garden church. It's going to be uh, it's going to be incredible uh, when it happens. <clears throat> We've had plans for the last three years now, <laughs> and uh, and I've got plans. I've got plans for my garden because at the moment, if you've ever been to my house, uh, if you haven't, don't come. All right, because from from the outside anyway, the front garden it looks it's a mess, and down the side as well, that's all overgrown and it, it's not looking its best. Um, okay, it's a bit of a mess, but I've got plans. I'm going to put a fence down there. Get some gravel. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm really excited. I'm really looking forward to, to the plants that I've got for my garden. I'm a person that does plan, though. Anyone else have plans? Planner? People that plan? I also have plans uh, for our spare room. I mentioned this last week, didn't I? The, um, the man cave. Yeah? <laughs> Slash Bible reading room. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I've got plans for that room as well. Sam and I have got some, drawn up some plans. And, uh, and I've got plans for, for my marriage. Yeah? I've got, I've got uh, Sam and I, you know, we, we talk. <laughs> uh, that helps. Uh, but but we've, got, we've got plans for our marriage and, and, you know, what we want that to look like, what we want our time to look like, what we want our uh, focus to be and where, you know, what we want to do and what we, what we want to uh, experience together uh, in our marriage. Yeah? I've got plans for our finances as well and how that's going to work out and, and hopefully uh, be okay. <laughs> but I've got plans. Has anyone got plans? So good, so good. Well, I think, I think we are all a people with plans and, uh, and some of our plans are sort of quite, quite close, aren't they? You know, in the near future. And, and some of our plans are, are far out in the, in the extended future uh, where, you know, where we, where we struggle to even, uh, even see sometimes. And, uh, you know, whether, whether we want to think about it this way or not, when we talk about our plans and what we see in the future, we're really talking about our vision, aren't we? Yeah? We're talking about vision. Vision is that which we can see um, sort of in, in, our, in our mind's eye, we can see the potential, we can see what could be. I can see what could be with our garden. I can see what could be with our spare room. I can see what could be in our marriage. It's, it's not there yet, but it's in the future. It's what, it's what it could be, yeah? And I've noticed, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I, I tend to think about things quite a lot, all right? Just sit and think and, uh, and sort of try and understand the world. Anyone do that? Yeah? And, uh, and something that I've noticed about these plans or this vision uh, process is that uh, vision really starts, I don't know if you've noticed this, but vision really starts when we observe the current state of things, yeah? When we can see what is about, when we, when we look at the current situation, the current circumstance in perhaps a particular area, we can see what's currently there. And then there becomes in us a dissatisfaction when we see what's there and we're like, whoa. Yeah, and that exact noise all right, is what we're looking for. Uh, and uh, and we, can, uh, we, we, we develop a sense of dissatisfaction because we can see what's currently there and we're like, mm, that's, not, that's not what it could be. That's not what it should be. And then we, we, we go and we look elsewhere, don't we, to see, uh, uh, perhaps uh, to be inspired to get an idea for what is good, to align ourselves with something that is, that is better than what we currently see, yeah? And so for my garden, I spend a lot of time on garden websites, right? And, and forums, getting ideas and seeing what, uh, what's going on. Google Images is great for this, yeah? 
You can Google pergola or pergola. Who knows how that's pronounced? Anyone? Which one is it? Pergola or pergola? Pergola? You sure? Could be either way, and that's all I'm saying. Anyway, um, but, uh, but, but I look to see, uh, to see you know, what, what, uh, what's good. And then I, uh, I, uh, I then ask the question, what could be? What could be? In our context, in our situation, in this specific area uh, that, I'm, that I'm looking at, that I've looked at, where I can see dissatisfaction, where I've looked uh, around and tried to see what is good, um, and then ask the question, well, what could be? What could be? And, uh, and I feel like this question of what could be is a really exciting but a really dangerous question to ask. Amen? It's really exciting, but it's, uh, but it's, really, it's really dangerous. And, uh, and, and I want to encourage us all this morning, and this is really the theme of, uh, of the message and where we're going this morning, because perhaps you don't see yourself as someone with vision. Perhaps you don't see yourself as someone who is even uh, a visionary, right? Anyone heard that phrase before? Yeah? And we attribute that phrase, that word, that title to all the great thinkers, don't we? Steve Jobs, visionary. Wow, that guy, you know, and uh, can't think of any others. (laughs) Who's that guy that said, let's go to the moon? Kennedy, was it Kennedy? Kennedy. Anyway, you know, these, these people, these are, they're the visionaries. You know, that's, that's, I'm not a visionary. But, uh, but I want to encourage us that I believe that God calls each of us and all of us to ask the question, what could be? And for all of us to be visionary, for all of us to have vision. And I want to, I want to show us this in, uh, in the book of Nehemiah, which is where we're focusing on for this, uh, for this series. Now, the context of the book of Nehemiah, for those of you that don't know, is this. The Israelites, God's people, uh, have been taken into exile, right? So they've been conquered in Jerusalem, and, uh, and the, the city's been destroyed, and God's people have been taken out, they've been exiled uh, into, into Babylon, into the, the Babylonian exile, and, uh, and it's not a great time for the Jewish people, for God's people. And, uh, and then in the book of Nehemiah, there's been some progress made, okay? Some people have gone back to Jerusalem, and they've started to rebuild the temple, which is good. That's the meeting place where people meet with God. And so the temple is rebuilt. And, uh, and then also uh, parts of, of the society as a whole right, is being rebuilt, slowly uh, coming back online, slowly uh, being rebuilt after the exile. And so that is where we jump into the book of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah hasn't yet gone back, right? He's still, uh, he's actually in, in Persia. He's, he's still exiled. Uh, he's still not back in his home uh, in his home city, and uh, and so this is where uh, this is where we meet Nehemiah as the cupbearer to the king, right? Cupbearer, someone who bears a cup, Just crushes wine, puts it in a cup, gives it to the king. We don't have that anymore. <laughs> you can't find that on LinkedIn, but uh, but it used to be a job. Anyway, <clears throat> Nehemiah, uh, verse uh, sorry, chapter one and verse two. Let's read together. Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burnt with fire. So in this, uh, in this, in this instance, in this uh, short uh, scripture that we've read, we can see, can we not, that Nehemiah sees or perhaps he hears uh, about the state of things, yeah? He's made aware of the current situation, the current circumstance. Um, he's been told that, you know, while some of the, the, the Jewish people, while some of the Israelites are back, uh, which, is, which is a good thing, uh, but they are in disgrace, things are not good, uh, because the walls of Jerusalem are broken down and its gates have been burnt with fire. And this is really, really bad in ancient times, all right? This is, this is really bad. We don't have walls around cities uh, these days, do we? No, we don't. Well, some might, yeah, I suppose. Uh, but in general, we don't. But back in, uh, back in those days, back in this time, it was really important for a city to have walls around it, right? This is a big deal. 
lots of, uh, lots of people milling around uh, that don't really get on, lots of sort of tribal type uh, disagreements, let's say. And, uh, and so if a, wall, if a city was without a wall, it was seen as defenseless, it was seen as weak, it was seen as undignified. And so the fact that the walls around Jerusalem were broken down is really bad. It's really, really bad. It's an actually an embarrassment to this city, which is supposed to be the city of God. And Nehemiah is made aware of this. And then we read from uh, verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So we see the second element of vision where this, this, this circumstance that Nehemiah has been made aware of has caused a significant distress in Nehemiah, yeah? There is a significant uh, discontentedness and a significant um, uh, uh, challenge within Nehemiah. He's deeply distressed. This is not just a minor inconvenience. This is a big problem that causes mourning. Uh, that causes, you know, uh, days, in fact, the Bible says, of, uh, of mourning and, uh, and weeping um, because of the situation, because of, of what he is aware of, because of what is going on uh, around him. And then we read from, uh, from verse 6, because Nehemiah begins then to align his heart with God. Nehemiah begins to, uh, to align his heart with God because he feels this dissatisfaction and so something is coming, something needs to be done. Uh, but first, Nehemiah needs to ensure that his heart is aligned with God, yeah? That he is in sync with the will of God. And, uh, and so Nehemiah spends some time in the next few verses. Um, from verse 6, I'll, I'll read. And he's confessing his own sins, but also the sins of Israel, the people as a whole. He's confessing his sins, which is what God calls us to do. Yeah? God calls us to, uh, into, into confession, into repentance from our sin. That much hasn't changed all the way from the Old Testament all the way to where we are now. We're called to repent of sin, to align ourselves with God. And that's exactly what Nehemiah does from verse 6. Uh, he says, let your ear, he's talking to God, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. So Nehemiah is aligning himself with God. He's ensuring that he is in sync with what God is doing. He's turning from his sin, and even the sin of, in fact, his entire people, and he's turning towards God. And so this is a really, uh, really important um, uh, element of uh, developing vision because Nehemiah needs to, it, it needs to be so that Nehemiah is not acting in his own, uh, or f for himself, and in his own uh, vision, yeah? But the, rather he turns to God. And then we read from verse uh, chapter 2, because the final element of this vision set is seen. Nehemiah doesn't intend to, to mope around and feel sorry for himself and, you know, sort of woe is me, um, or, or even allow the injustice that is happening in the city uh, to go uh, unconfronted, but rather uh, he intends to do something about it. And so he goes to the king, who, by the way, is not an Israelite. He's not part of, uh, of God's people. He doesn't worship God. And Nehemiah goes to the king and says, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let, me, uh, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. So Nehemiah intends to do something about it. And so throughout this, this first, these opening few, uh, few verses, uh, chapter 1 and into chapter 2 of Nehemiah, we see the formation of a vision, don't we? We see the formation of a vision which is, uh, which, which is initially uh, prompted by observing or hearing about that which is uh, around the current state of things, the current situation, circumstance, um, a, a discontent with what we see, with what Nehemiah sees, and then 
a, uh, an alignment to God to make sure that his heart is right with God, and then he intends to do something about it once he is, he is assured that he is in line with God. So this is, this is a formation of, of a vision, and, uh, and, and the Bible is really very, very clear about vision. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is clear about vision? Yeah? Come on. This is top quality stuff, church. All right? It is subtle, yeah. Maybe you just don't get it. It's fine. That's fine. Keep it to myself next time. The Bible is really very, very clear about vision. Uh, and, and it's clear that God's people must have vision. God's people must have vision. It is, in fact, a necessity. And I want to read to us from Proverbs 29 and verse 18, because Proverbs 29 and verse 18 is often used, uh, we often uh, seek this verse, and, 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 and what we understand from this verse is the importance of vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. If we don't have vision, then it will be bad for us, yeah? But, uh, but actually, you know, there is so much more to this verse that we need to understand um, because we're not just talking about any vision and we're not just talking about any perish, perishing. See, that, that, uh, that version there that I just read, that where there is no vision, the people perish, that's taken from the King James Version, right? It's one version uh, that puts it like that. Uh, the NIV writes it like this, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. The ESV version uh, translation of the Bible says, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. You see, the Bible doesn't talk about us developing our own vision. It talks about uh, the need for us to understand God's revelation. It talks about the need for us to, uh, to seek after God's vision. What is God's uh, vision for a situation, for a circumstance, for a people, for us as individuals? What is God's revelation to us? That's what the Bible speaks about. Where there is no revelation from God, where we don't, where we don't seek and find the revelation from the Lord, we will perish. So we're not just making our own stuff up, but we're seeking his will. And so Nehemiah had a view to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, did you notice in Nehemiah that nowhere was it written that God told Nehemiah to do that? Nowhere does God say to Nehemiah, Nehemiah, I want you to go and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. It seems, in fact, to be Nehemiah's own idea, something that, is, that, that comes from him. He's dissatisfied that, that the wall is broken down, and so he's going to rebuild it. God didn't tell him to do that. But we do see, really, really crucially, really, really importantly, that Nehemiah first aligns himself to God to ensure that his vision was aligned with God's vision. That his revelation, that, that he knew God's revelation. And that informed what he did and the idea that he went forward with. And I find this, I find this, this really interesting and this really this, challenging in some ways. Because when we think about our own, uh, our own, our own stuff, our own, um, our own uh, kind of what we're going to do, our, our strategy, you know, for our own lives or for, uh, for our ministry, for our church, often we can wait for God to tell us to do something specific. Have you noticed that? Have you been around church a while? you noticed that? I'm waiting for God to tell me whether or not we should uh, start a youth ministry. I'm waiting for God to tell me whether or not we should, you know, uh, be life group leaders. But actually, what I've noticed is the Bible, the Bible shows time and time again that it's actually the people of God where idea is birthed as long as they are aligned with the vision and will of God. Yeah? As long as we understand God's general revelation and God's will uh, and, and God's vision for 
our world, for ourselves, for our community, the details, a lot of the time, he leaves down to us. Have you noticed that? As long as we are aligned with him. And so what does this mean for us? I believe that the start of Nehemiah, the bit that we've read, acts as a blueprint. It acts as a blueprint uh, for us to emulate, for us to look around at the things uh, that we see, at the state of things, at the situations and circumstances, to ask what parts of these things, of what we see, causes a dissatisfaction and a discontentedness and even sometimes a distress in us, deep within us. And then to go to God to make sure that our hearts are aligned with his heart. To make sure that we are receiving his vision, his revelation. Not in the minutia and in the details, but in the general. Lord, what is your will? And then to then ask, okay, so what could be? What could be? Within the will of God, as long as we're aligned with him, what could be? And I've found, for me personally, that this outworks in three main areas. In three main areas in my life. The first is the personal. The second is the practical. And the third is the people. And so the personal is really challenging. <laughs> Who's ready to be challenged this morning? Yeah? yeah. The, 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 the personal is really challenging because it deals with us. It deals with us internally, inside. And, and so, you know, we as a Christian, you as a Christian, have a responsibility. What is your relationship with God like? Your heart, your actions, how you treat others, and what parts of that causes a holy dissatisfaction? And then to seek God's revelation for your life and then to ask what could be. What could be in my life? I've got some examples. Will that help? Yeah? Examples are always good. Um, f- for my own life. Right? So, um, so in terms of me and, and the personal, and I, I, I look at, what does my devotional t- what does my relationship with God look like? What does my relationship with God look like? And uh, and so and so I look and uh, and I see what parts of my relationship with God cause a dissatisfaction. What parts of, of my relationship with God am I am I not happy with at the moment? And I do this I do this regularly. But what parts of that aren't I, aren't I satisfied with, aren't, aren't, aren't as good as it could be? And, uh, and so then I seek God's vision for my life and my own personal relationship with God. What is God's vision for my life and my relationship with him? Well, he died on a cross to tell me. He died on a cross so that I could have a, a, a personal, deep, meaningful relationship with God. Amen? I'm just talking about me. This is the same for you. And so then I ask, well, okay, so what could be? How can I walk more in God's vision for my life? How can I do that better? What, what, could, what could be different about this situation? What if I were closer to God, able to hear from him more, knew his word better? What if I spent daily time with God? Now, God's vision for my life, it didn't include specific strategy. It didn't, God never said to me, Don, what I want you to do? At 7 o'clock every morning, I want you to open your Bible, and we're going to have some time, and I'm going to share some things with you, and I want you to pray to me and worship me, and then I want you to read the Word, and, uh, and that's how we're going to do it. God didn't do that. God never said that to me. But he did say, Dom, I want to spend time with you, and I want you to spend time with me. And so how that works is then, well, that's up to me, isn't it? Another, another example um, the provision for my family, how Sam and I provide for our family. And so I look and I think, you know, this is not as good as it could be. It's not as good as it could be. It's not as stable as it should be. There are some areas of dissatisfaction in, 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 in terms of the provision for my family. And so I see God's vision for this area of my life. What do I think God wants? What does his word tell me that God wants for me in terms of a leader of our household? Well, he wants me to be a good leader, doesn't he? Yeah? And, uh, and he, wants, he wants me to provide and facilitate for my family's needs. Yeah? And so then I ask, well, what could be? What could be then? What could our finances look like if we planned a little bit better? What, uh, what could it be like if we counted up the cost before we started on, on projects? That's why we haven't done the garden yet. 
What, what, what could it be like? God didn't include specifics in that. He didn't tell me, Dom, I need you to open a pension investment account. I need you to invest X amount every month in the S&P 500. Right? That's not what God said to do. But he did say, Dom, I need you to provide for your family. And so this is why it's a challenge uh, for us personally. What is God's revelation for your life? First and foremost, the revelation from God will reveal this, that he wants us to repent of our sin and turn to him. Yeah? And often that's the most challenging bit. We are to repent of our sin and turn to God. And then from that foundation, beyond that, what is his heart's desire for you? And how uh, and does your heart align with God? And that, so that's the personal, yeah? That's the first thing. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. Well, it's got a bit quiet because it's a challenge. That's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. The next, the next thing then is, is the practical. And that's the stuff that we're involved with. The, 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 the practical application of, of our lives. And what, what's that? It's our community. It's our work. It's our ministry. It's our church. It's the various things uh, that we're involved with on more of a practical level. What parts of that cause dissatisfaction? What parts of that cause a holy discontentment? And then we seek God's revelation and vision for the various elements that we're involved with, or, or perhaps sometimes not involved with. And we see, you know, God, uh, what, what is your vision for this thing? What, what is your vision for this church? Or what is your vision for this town, rather? What is your vision? What is your revelation? What do you want to see happen here? And then we ask, what could be? What could be? And so the challenge is this, look around. What causes you dissatisfaction? What is God's vision for that area? Not the specifics or the strategy, but the heart and the direction. Because here's the thing, can I be honest? Okay. <clears throat> when I look at our church, I am dissatisfied. I am discontent. Yeah? And I don't think there's anything wrong with that whatsoever. I think that is a good thing. I am discontent. I am dissatisfied. But, uh, and, and some of you in this place, hopefully, are like that. I hope you are. I really hope you are. Discontent and dissatisfied with Assemble Church. You know why? Because it's from that dissatisfaction that stuff happens. It's from that dissatisfaction that we seek God's, God's will, God's revelation uh, for, uh, for, for what he wants. And then we ask the question, well, what then could be? What then could be? And we all have a choice, just like Nehemiah had a choice. See, our dissatisfaction can either lead us to uh, the discouragement of, uh, of, of sort of mopiness, can't it? Yeah? Is that an option? Yeah. Anyone recognize that as an option? I do. Uh, or it can lead us to encouragement into action. And so our, our discontentedness, our dissatisfaction is a good thing. And we get to choose which route we go down, don't we? We get to choose where to go. We can go into mopiness and discouragement, or we could be encouraged that there is stuff for us to do. Yeah? And this is why I, I, I'm, 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 I'm pleased, if you like, and I'm happy. It's kind of a, 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 a two-sided coin. Whilst I'm dissatisfied with our church and our ministry, it's a good and it's a holy dissatisfaction. It's a holy and it's a good dissatisfaction. I'm not discouraged. I'm not discouraged. I'm encouraged that there is so much opportunity, so much that we could do. I'm encouraged that there are so many ways that we can help and serve. I'm encouraged that there are so many areas where we can call down uh, heaven to come to earth in Newark. I'm so encouraged that there's so much stuff for us to do. And we have a responsibility to align our hearts with God, to seek his revelation, and then to ask, what could be? What could be? And then to do something about it. And then to do something about it. So that's the practical. And then the final area that I've noticed in, in my life is the people. And this, this is, in many ways, it was more important than the practical. But it's also a lot harder. It's a lot harder. And so the challenge is this. Look at the people around you. What causes you a dissatisfaction and a discontentment? 
And then see God's revelation and vision for the people around you and ask what could be. Who around you doesn't know Jesus yet? And what's God's vision for them? Who around you doesn't see the value in themselves the same way that God sees the value in them? And then what is God's vision for them? Who around you is in need of support and care? And what is God's vision for them? A holy and a divine dissatisfaction with the way things are is the beginning of something good, of something exciting. It's the start of the next thing. Because if we were all just satisfied and everything was just great and everything was just perfect, there'd be nothing to do, would there? There'd be nothing to do. Uh, And I can assure you there's stuff to do. There is stuff to do because there are still people in Newark, as far as I'm aware, that don't yet know Jesus. Is that, would I be accurate in saying that? And do we think that that is God's vision and God's will for his people in this town? No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. When we ask God, Lord, what is your revelation? What is your vision for Newark? I mean, we can articulate that in in many different ways. But we know, don't we? We know because we read his word. We know because we know the heart of God. We know because, uh, because we seek after and we, and we pray and we ask, Lord, would you break my heart for what breaks yours? And we know that God's will for this town is that every man, woman, and child would come to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That every single man, woman, and child would be spared from an eternity in Uh, of of damnation and instead saved to an eternity in paradise with him. We know that God's heart for every man, woman, and child in Newark is that they will be led by the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, that they would be a people filled with hope, that they would be a people filled with joy, that they would be uh, a people who know, uh, know who they are and know whose they are. This is God's will, God's revelation for the people in Newark. And so the question then that we ask is, well, then what could be? How then do we get to experience and to, and to call heaven down and to experience God's will and God's revelation for his town in this place? What do we do about that? And so here's the plan. <clears throat> and you can do this now or perhaps you can, uh, you can, you, you can do this in in your own time at home or or both. But I'd like to take some time to reflect, to reflect on God's vision, to to reflect on God's revelation for your life at the personal level, yourself. Where are the areas of dissatisfaction? Where are the areas uh, where... um, that that cause a, a, a discontentedness and a distress... And then to ask, ask God for his revelation into those areas. And then ask the question, what could be? And then take some time to reflect on the practical, the stuff, the things, the programs, the ministries, the teams, the great commission that we're called to. And ask the question, what could be? What could be? And then finally, the people, those that God has placed around you. What is his revelation? What is his vision for those people? And then ask the question, what could be? For us to look at the dissatisfaction, to ask for God's revelation for those things and his vision for those things, and then to be encouraged. And then to be encouraged that there is so much opportunity to bring about the plans and purposes of God. And then ask the question, what could be? What could be, as I said at the start, is a truly exciting place to be. And I'd like to invite you into what could be. Because it is a really exciting place. It's an incredible place. But it's also, I need to warn you. Can I warn you? Because the question, what should be, could be. It puts us in a place. It puts us in a place of constantly being aware that things aren't what they could be. 
It puts us in a place of being constantly aware that we're not quite there yet. It puts us in a place of being constantly, effectively dissatisfied. And we need to be prepared, church, that we are actually, we are called to be a church that is dissatisfied. And we can, we can be in this place, and as I said earlier, it can take us in one of two directions. We can either be discouraged or we can be encouraged. And I want to invite you into a place of being dissatisfied but being encouraged. I want to invite us into a place of being dissatisfied but being aware of all that there is to do. All that there is that God wants us to do in this town, in this place. <clears throat> but it's a scary place to be. It is a scary place to be because we're in attention of what we can see now versus what God has shown us. In our, in our heart and in our mind's eye. I want to invite us into this place of what could be. Because we pray a prayer every week, don't we? And we're going to pray it in a minute. And this prayer, <clears throat> it's called the Lord's Prayer. And it calls down the kingdom of heaven. We say this line, we say, Lord, your will be done on earth in Newark as it is in heaven. And I wonder, I wonder if when we pray that, we really mean it. We're calling for ourselves to come into alignment with God, amen? That we would know a little bit more of, of what the kingdom of God looks like in us and then we can go and do something about it because church, we're a church that's called to do something, aren't we? Does any, any one of us believe that this morning? <clears throat> that we're a church that's called to do something in the same way that Nehemiah did something. We're called to do something. We're called to rebuild city walls. Church, we're called to see the sick healed. Church, we are called to see the lost found and find Jesus. We're called to see the gospel preached. We're called to see the gospel proclaimed, the people evangelized to. We're called to see ground reclaimed in his name. We are called to see his kingdom come. And so we need to ask the question, what could be? What could be? I want to encourage us all because it's by asking this question that we are going to see a true a move of God through this people through this people that we're going to see a move of God that we're going to see incredible things that we're going to see people saved and I'm so excited but we got to start asking the question what could be and what can I do about it as well I don't want us to be a church that just comes on a Sunday and sings some songs hears from the Bible I mean that is important and we will always continue to do that but if, if we stay there if we stay in that place of just doing that then we've missed the point of the Great Commission completely, completely. We are called to be a church that asks what could be. And I'm super excited, I'm super excited. Let's worship and let's praise his name together.